Okay, welcome everyone. Glad to have you here today. I hope you're enjoying the lunch. We've got lunch at the back. If you need drinks, they're also at the back, but only soda and water, I'm afraid. So, uh, thanks. Might, might need something stronger. Yeah, perhaps. You could need something stronger. <laughs> well, today we're pleased to bring you this panel, the R Street Institute, um, and particularly our, uh, our tech policy group run by the wonderful Zach Graves over there, who's, who's waving. Thank you. Thank you, Zach, for uh, bringing me out from Sacramento. So uh, today we're pleased to bring you a panel which contemplates how we intend to realize our autonomous future. Specifically, in light of recent guidance from the Department of Transportation, what role the federal government will have to play in that process. So sitting before you, uh, I am Ian Adams. I am a fellow at the R Street Institute. And when I'm not doing that, I'm an attorney with Ora Carrington and Sutcliffe and uh, out in Sacramento. So I get to deal with it at the state level most of the time, but it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've got the Honorable David Strickland, who is a partner <laughs> at uh, Venable and is also counsel for the Self-Driving Coalition for Safer Streets. And then we have Hillary Kane, the Director of uh, Technology and Innovation Policy at Toyota. Uh, she handles autonomous vehicles in that capacity and is a uh, former house staffer, I believe. So True. you've spent some Don't time in this building. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Mark Scribner, a fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute who focuses on transportation, land use, and urban growth policy issues. And then we have Gary Shapiro, president of the Consumer Technology Association, which represents 2,200 consumer technology companies and owns and produces the world-renowned trade show CES. If you've not been, you should go. It's wonderful. Um, a lot of fun in Vegas. <laughs> and then at the end, we've got Adam Thayer, a senior research fellow at George Mason University's Mercatus Center, where he specializes in technology, media, internet, and free speech policies. So we've got a panel that has thought long and hard about these things, and we're excited to have them for you today. So. Uh, I figure we should start off with some background, just in case not everyone is totally on the same page, having not spent time with the 116-page document that NHTSA provided for all of us. So uh, I think we'll start with David, who, as a former administrator of NHTSA, uh, would you share why NHTSA <coughs> needed to develop these specific guidelines and uh, the timing? Why were they released now? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity, first of all. I'm my mouth is big enough unless you need me for the uh, for the cameras. I can do without the mic. Oh, we'll pull a little closer. All right, that's a little better. Um, it's a great question. Well, first and foremost, um, NHTSA, in the absence of having a Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard or other regulation, uh, has nothing to fill the space in terms of preemption. Uh, so basically, the field is wide open for states uh, to uh, possibly enact um, state statutes which could have the posture of regulating vehicle design uh, and other aspects of the car, which frankly runs against uh, long established federal policy and actually will cause huge disruptions in the marketplace if that was to happen. Um, second, uh, the agency also needed to learn. Uh, they are in position, frankly, as most other uh, constituencies and institutions in the self-driving ecosystem, while they have clear knowledge about vehicle systems and safety, uh, there is a number of novel questions that are being posed by the impact of self-driving at various levels. So the document, as much as it is to sort of establish responsibilities for the federal government, responsibilities for the states via the bully pulpit, the document is not a legally enforceable um, document so that they can go and actually stop a state from doing something, but it gives clarification, but it also invites, frankly, information. They're trying to learn. So those are the, really the two aspects of why the agency did it. The agency was actually behind in issuing this guidance for a number of reasons. So the issue of why now isn't so much they wanted to do it much earlier uh, because they saw what was happening in the states in terms of evolving legislative proposals and things that were happening in California. Uh, so they knew, they recognized they need to fill the space quickly. So those are the A and B reasons why the agency has moved in this direction. And some of what was going on in California, that was problematic from NHTSA's perspective, you think? <laughs> I mean, I think it's problematic from a number of aspects, but NHTSA recognizing that if it does not show some leadership to fill the void, states would do it for them, and perhaps in a way that the agency felt it was either not the appropriate 
direction or frankly may have unintended consequences of the marketplace. So can't speak for the agency in terms of what it thought about the California proposed regulations, but the fact that California was moving in this direction and creating a number of things such as, you know, uh, third party verification of systems and all these other types of things, uh, the agency felt that it needed to move as quickly as possible. Sure. Okay. Well, Hillary, I noticed that you've brought uh, all of the printed out guidelines. So <laughs> instead of just reading them to us, would you be so kind? <laughs> would you be so kind as to as to give us an overview of uh, what's included in them? Uh, yeah, sure. So I don't know if this is. It's live. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's basically four main elements to the guidance. You could break it down into four main parts. Uh, the first element is a 15 point safety assessment. Uh, that uh, developers of the technology are being asked slash expected slash told uh, to provide to NHTSA. Uh, it goes over a lot of different areas, cybersecurity, privacy, as well as human machine interface, uh, ethical considerations. There's a lot of things within these 15 uh, different areas within the assessment. Uh, the second piece is essentially model guidance to the state. So to David's point, there was a lot of confusion about what role states were supposed to be playing or should be playing or could be playing in the space. And this is uh, guidance from NHTSA on sort of where states should play. Uh, what they've generally done is, is two things. First, they've said uh, stick to what it is that you have traditionally regulated. So. NHTSA has traditionally regulated vehicle performance and design. Um, the states have generally regulated things like registration and licensing and insurance and liability and those things. But it does something else interesting, which I think we'll probably dig into later, which is essentially asks each state to set up a structure whereby developers of the technology would, would apply to the state uh, for approval to test these systems within the state limits. Okay, so the third piece uh, is uh, basically a section where NHTSA goes through all of its existing <coughs> authorities that it could utilize to expedite the deployment of this technology, goes through each of them, talks about some of the limitations and some of the ways that they are committing to use those processes more quickly uh, to help get this technology on the roads. Uh, and then the fourth piece is an exploration of new authorities uh, that NHTSA is either seeking or exploring uh, that could be new ways of getting this type of technology um, onto the road. A lot of those would require some sort of congressional uh, approval legislation in order to make them be, but not, not all of them. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. Okay, well, and so as we move forward in this conversation, it might be helpful just to have a sense of the levels of automation. Would you, would you take us through what those are? Yeah, so um, as we, uh, we anticipated that the guidance, and, and it, it to a certain degree is true, uh, was only going to apply to highly automated systems. So what's a highly automated system? So basically, um, I'm, I'm going to try to do this as easily as I can. Uh, there's essentially five levels uh, under SAE definitions of automation. So level one is basically um, a system that can steer for you or a system that can accelerate or decelerate on its own. So think about lane keep assist might be something we're familiar with. If you start to veer out of a lane, it puts you back in your lane. Or adaptive cruise control is something you may see on the road today, which the car will slow down or speed up based on what the car ahead of it is doing. So that's level one. Level two is putting those two things essentially together. So now you've got something that's steering for you and something that's accelerating and decelerating for you, but that's all it's doing. Okay, there's every, all the other rest of driving is your, your job is, as the driver of the vehicle. Level three is basically a system that can do um, quite a bit more of the driving, so not just steering and accelerating and braking, uh, but is looking to you to continue to stay part of the loop. So if something goes wrong, the vehicle encounters something that it can't handle, it passes the job of driving back over to you. Level four is a system that does all of the driving, but only in some places. So think of an automated highway driving system or a, a system that works only on college campuses. And then level five is it does all the driving for you all of the time, okay? <laughs> So the, the uh, highly automated, uh, by de uh, NHTSA's definition, applies to level three, four, and five. Uh, they did do an interesting thing that I'll note, maybe we can dig into later, which is we thought that this was only going to apply to highly automated systems, but NHTSA has made clear that that 15-point safety assessment I talked about will also apply uh, almost entirely, not completely, but almost entirely to lower uh, systems of automation. Okay, so in light of that, 
uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll move to sort of a, a big picture, good, bad, neutral. Uh, Mark, what is your perspective on the guidelines in terms of uh, their value currently and, and the direction they're putting us in? I think by and large, um, this is a positive step uh, for the reasons David uh, laid out. You know, NHTSA is signaling that it's going to occupy the field here and not allow to have uh, the states to set up uh, 50 different mini NHTSAs, which I think would be a disaster. Um, that being said, I do think there are some problems uh, with the way NHTSA approached this, um, one being that NHTSA, you know, repeatedly stresses that this is a non-binding guidance document. Um, and that's true. It's a non-binding guidance document. Um, but that 15-point uh, performance, uh, those 15-point uh, performance guidelines that NHTSA lays out in Section 1, uh, then in Section 2, they, in their model state policy, they go around and say, well, you should bake those guidelines into your permit application process. So in effect, NHTSA is asking states to mandate these for them. And I think that should be troubling because, um, uh, at the very least, I think this this uh, harms NHTSA's credibility on the issue, uh, and that it's really not being an honest dealer here. Um, second, um, in the modern regulatory tools, Section Four, NHTSA contemplates replacing or augmenting uh, its traditional uh, self-certification authority with uh, pre-market approval. Um, I think that this would be a, a disaster um, uh, in, in that it not only goes as far as Europe, it, it surpasses Europe, at least in Europe under their type approval regime. Uh, when regs are written, uh, the don't, or, or rather, when regs are absent and don't address a feature, the, uh, the pre-market approval process doesn't apply, whereas that would be the opposite uh, of what NHTSA would uh, the, uh, sort of contemplates in Section 4. Um, and they also compare it to the FAA, you know, uh, certification process, aircraft certification process, and sort of the odd thing with that, while NHTSA ult uh, ultimately admits that it's uh, any pre-market approval system administered by it would likely be even more complex than the FAA's aircraft certification system. Um, the FAA is actually moving in the opposite direction and is currently seeking right now to loosen its, its longstanding certification process, um, especially right now with, uh, with small aircraft in light of uh, the small unmanned aircraft systems. Um, and then, not really a criticism of this, but I guess, um, and this kind of goes to, um, I wonder if David could, could address this point. But um, so David raised the issue of, of preemption, of occupying the field here. Um, there's a problem. There was a case uh, a few years ago, uh, Williamson v. Mazda, where the Supreme Court held that, in fact, that automakers uh, fully compliant with federal motor vehicle safety standards may not be exempt from state tort liability. Um, and I think that's a problem uh, that should be addressed. That, I think, is something that Congress could address by making clear in the statute uh, that uh, federal motor vehicle safety standards do preempt these state tort claims. Um, and David was administer, uh, administrator then, um, so he may have uh, additional thoughts on that. Well, you know, that ultimately is sort of a policy decision. And since there is, frankly, different agency positions in terms of whether uh, regulatory occupation forecloses state tort liability, uh, such as the FDA medical devices defenses, I think is basically akin to uh, uh, what you're alluding to. And I think one of the reasons why the court made that particular decision was that automobile safety um, is often not parallel with the current state of what the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards are. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not that is a proper policy position or not, the agency sort of quiet, but I think the reason why the court made that decision is there's a number of F FMVSS to keep me from you know, having to say <laughs> those five words over and over again. The FM, some FMVSS are over 35 years old, sure. and clearly the state of the art has moved well beyond that, so I think the court was loath to upend what the standard of care is in those particular situations. But circling back to the issue in terms of preemption and clarifying sort of the, you know, state role in terms of how you, you know, don't create 50 little mini NHTSAs, I think is incredibly important in right. sort of thinking about that. And I think that is the clearest aspect of what would basically be incredibly disruptive in deploying a technology has the potential to save thousands upon thousands of lives when fully deployed. Right. Well, so Gary, I, I want to bring you into this. Uh, what what is your sort of big picture perspective on on where the guidance is currently? Well, my big picture perspective on behalf of over two thousand companies is that this is really important, and here's why. Um, last year, thirty five thousand Americans died in vehicle collisions. 
the year before was 30,000. 5,000 increased in one year. That's a huge number of people dying, where according to NHTSA, 93% of the crashes are by human error or human choice. So the big picture that we'll be talking about with our grandchildren and children, that you'll remember hopefully from this day, is that you were part of something which made a difference in saving lives. Because we've all been touched by the loss of life, and now we have the opportunity to do something about it through technology. And that's incredibly important. It's incredibly important because there's going to be a lot of, it's, it's going to be a process to get there. And I think what NHTSA did is, is beautiful in the tone it set. The tone it set, and President Obama wrote a, 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 what I thought was a great commentary, that this is really important, and this is something we, we could change the world on. But there are things that's going to happen along the way. There's going to be forces working against this. There's a lot of jobs that are drivers. There's a lot of insurance companies making money. There's a lot of collision repair shops and emergency room doctors and people who do after parts auto and things like that that are going to say, this is not the best idea. I've heard people already say, you know, I'll give up my car when I give up my gun. I've heard people say this is not worth it because of the jobs will be out there. And my question to them is how many jobs equal one life? Technology has always been very disruptive. And I represent a group of companies that by definition disrupts the status quo with new technologies, with new innovations. And I spent my career making sure that these technologies can come forward. What NITS has done is say we think this is a good thing. What President Obama has done, and I, and I hope and believe the next president will say as well, is this is really important. I think it's so important that we got to engage not just government through the standard notice and comment rulemaking, but I think what has to happen is we have to get together with the stakeholders involved, as we did with HDTV and other efforts, including the internet itself, both of which I was involved in, and say what is important for us to go forward. How do we do it in a consensus way with a goal in mind? And the goal should be very clear. The goal should be saving human lives. And I would put a number to that, and I would put a specific date to it. And that way, we'll have something we're all working towards in a positive way. And engineers and policy people will give their contributions and hash it out in the court of a public opinion. But by creating a framework and a tone. Now, do I agree with everything in it? I could give you some specifics of things I'm concerned about. Please. Oh, well, I, I just, I wanted to stay on a high level. This is a low level then. But, you know, the, the truth is, is that this is something which is, is um, there are a lot of details there. And there's, look, we've all been operating under a statutory framework, which is almost as old as the automobile itself. That's an exaggeration, I know, and Administrator, you know that. But, but it's pretty old. And it's based well, upon the here. concept that there's a person behind the steering wheel. And that person is awake, alive, sentient, sober, et cetera. That's no longer going to be the case. I'll give you one example. Google has done some experiments with self-driving cars already, and they had their employees drive them. They pulled back on their own research in that because they, they saw what their employees were doing is they weren't paying attention. They were falling asleep. They were reading. They were doing text because the car took over. And it's still a little early for that to occur, as we said, we've seen with a couple of Tesla incidents, and we, but we're almost there. What you will see at the CES in Las Vegas is a huge number of self-driving cars. The introductions are coming quickly, the demonstrate, not, not actual models for sale, but you're, you're also seeing steps to get there. You're seeing active, passive collision avoidance, but you're also seeing active collision avoidance. So you're seeing cars which are getting safer every year. So one of the issues we should be grappling with immediately is why have deaths gone up? so dramatically. Now, of course, it's the price of gasoline, it's the miles driven, but texting is still an issue. There's still issues out there. The driverless car will resolve basically all the distracted driving. It's not only distracted driving, it's driving while sleepy, it's people are inebriated, it's, 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 it's a freeing mechanism for elderly and disabled people. There's nothing, no more excited group, and I've talked to disabled groups about this. This is their liberation. It could be also a parent's liberation for getting your kids around. It could be something that's, <laughs> and of course, it's very green. So it's a worthy goal. But now, but you know, there's some there's some efforts to have self um, and go from a self certification regime to a regime where every model has to be approved. There's an effort to expand jurisdiction beyond automakers to those who put in aftermarket products. There's some things there which I think have to be discussed and, and addressed in a reasonable way. But I think it's, it's the perfect tone. And I was so pleased, as one who's been critical of federal government, 
regulatory overreach, I think this, this was important because as someone who represents an industry which has delighted consumers with a range of products, it's so important that you could take a product in New York and have it work in California. People expect their cars to work in one place to another. With self-driving cars, it gets a little more complex. It's just not a matter of following the speed limit. There's different laws in different states, and there will be different laws in different states. But when it comes to all these different areas where state versus federal, I think it's time the federal has to step up just a little bit more than it has, and I think NITS has done that. Okay. Well, so, Adam, you're someone that's occasionally critical of the federal government. Uh, I, wonder, <laughs> I, I wonder, would you be willing to, to go into and discuss some of the proposed new authority that NHTSA is seeking and, and some of the issues with that? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, so I want to build on a few things that uh, Gary and Mark just pointed out. First of all, Gary pointed out quite rightly that we need to talk about the baseline for the debate uh, over driverless car technology as being the current world situation that we live in today, where the death toll remains staggeringly high in terms of uh, vehicle fatalities and accidents and, uh, and injuries. Um, uh, you can remember basically a simple 94-94 principle, which is that, as Gary pointed out, NHTSA points out in its uh, document that about 94 percent of all these uh, accidents that are on the road each year are caused by human error. And roughly of the roughly 34, 35,000 uh, lives that have been lost, that's approximately about 94, 95 a day. Um, that's a staggering death toll. Um, and NHTSA has quite rightly pointed out in uh, other things that released last week that we want to get to a world of zero deaths. Um, and so the question is, how do we move from that baseline, right? And this is particularly important because NHTSA just also announced that the numbers have actually gone up in recent years. Um, just last year, we, uh, we saw a 10.4 percent increase over first quarter of last year in terms of the number of deaths. So that, that needs to change. So clearly, driverless cars can help us change, uh, change that. And NHTSA is to be commended for taking the action it has here to sort of set the right tone and talk about, as it did in the subtitle of its uh, guidance documents, the revolutionary potential uh, of this technology to really reverse this situation. Um, so much so that other uh, experts on this have said that this could end up constituting the greatest public health success story of our time if we get this right. So this is a big deal, right? So uh, a lot of good things can have been said and, and should be said about what NITS is doing here, particularly about the state uh, policies and sort of getting a, a common framework. I think that's really excellent. Let me just jump right to the chase, though, given my limited time, and, and talk about what is really going to be the key issue and I think the ongoing policy battle over driverless car technology. And Mark already pointed it out. I think it really comes down to the pre-market approval authority and the question of this sort of gradual, maybe quite sudden shift in NHTSA's approach to regulating motor vehicle technology. Um, this is really essential, and I was kind of surprised, as I think Mark already pointed out, that NHTSA uses the FAA as a framework um, in, in a footnote uh, that is dropped in, in around page 72 when it begins its discussion of pre-market approval. Uh, it says, see, uh, see Appendix 2 about the, the FAA model, in which it cites that the duration of the FAA certification process varies. Typically, they last three to five years for approval of new aircraft. However, most recent FAA certification process for new commercial aircraft has been considerably longer, and it points out that the, B the Boeing 787 Dreamliner consumed 200,000 hours of FAA staff time and lasted eight years. <laughs> so needless to say, that should not be our model for driverless <laughs> car technology, right? I think we can hopefully all agree on that. So uh, I think NHTSA needs to be careful about saying, let's, let's take a look at the FAA model or even the FDA model and say that works here. I don't think it does. And as Mark pointed out, even the FAA started moving, moving away from it, and so is FDA for a variety of network technologies, uh, be it commercial drones in the aviation context or smartphone technologies uh, in the FDA context, where the FDA has most recently said our traditional pre-certification regime just isn't going to work for things that happen this quick, um, uh, innovation that happens this quickly. This is particularly important because right after the, F, uh, the NHTSA talks about the pre-certification authority, it then gets into a section which I find very concerning about post-sale authority to regulate software changes and basically says uh, on 77 that such updates would themselves constitute new items of motor vehicle equipment subject to the certification requirement and verification to the extent applicable to federal motor vehicle safety standards. This is 
the real collision of the sort of worlds of permissionless innovation and the precautionary principle mindsets, the ideas that I've written about in a recent book of the same title, which you can find uh, free online, uh, <laughs> is that these sort of Beautiful conflicting worldviews about how technological <laughs> governance should work for emerging technologies is really coming through again and again as software eats the world, as uh, Mark Andreessen likes to say. And what we have seen is connected internet uh, digital technologies colliding with traditional analog era automotive technologies. And innovation is just happening at a much, much faster pace than NHTSA and other agencies are used to. Something's got to give. And I think in the context of pre-market certification, that's just not going to fly if each and every iteration of software has to be pre-approved that's going to delay the introduction of these new technologies and therefore delay our goal of moving us away from that baseline of moving away from 94 deaths per day. So uh, whether, whether or not the regulatory environment exists that can encourage this technology, the technology is going to have to be adopted by consumers ultimately. So uh, I, I would ask uh, David, uh, how, how real is that concern that there is a level of consumer fear of this technology and, and how can that be addressed? I'll start off and I think I'll probably lean into Hillary to talk about that since her company is banking on a pipeline to deploy these technologies in their fleet. But the, what I have seen in terms of working with uh, my members of the coalition, it's that Consumer acceptance is usually one of actually having the ability for a consumer to have a hands-on experience with the technology. What we've been seeing in a number of, you know, there's been lots of polls and research um, dives into whether or not a person would be interested in buying a self-driving car. And I kind of uh, analogize it to a bit of a push-pull. Because if you have no experience with the technology, you go back to what is your experience with internet-driven technology that you have today? You know. Um, handheld devices occasionally freeze and need to be rebooted and, and you have these sort of issues. And when you apply that to something that is actually moving at 65 miles an hour, you don't necessarily <laughs> want to be very comfortable having a blue screen of death or a reboot or a spinning beach ball or whatever the case may be. So <laughs> people say no. I am not comfortable and some, I've seen numbers between 60 and 70 percent say they're not comfortable. But the flip that I've seen um, with a number of situations, a number of my members, is that once people are in the technology, they are universally not only acceptive of it, but they actually like, when can I have it? So I think the issue is ultimately going to be, frankly, between anybody in the ecosystem, whether it's the manufacturers, the innovators, uh, the various constituencies and groups that are supportive of this technology, to be able to be able to have exposure in a very wide way. And I think consumer acceptance will be uh, frankly, a very simple issue. In 2007, if somebody gave you a piece of flat glass that fits in the palm of your hand and said, hey, in a few years, this is going to basically control most of your waking moments, you would think <laughs> that you're crazy. But everybody in this room probably has some type of a handheld device, hopefully not a Note 7. Um, uh, sorry. Um, has a handheld device that, frankly, rules your world. I think that self-driving technology and various iterations will, frankly, have the same type of acceptance um, arc and scope. But Hillary? Yeah, so I, I always think this is an interesting question because it sort of presupposes that there's like this point upon which the technology will be forced on you as a consumer and that you will have to buy it. And I don't think anyone's talking about that, at least today. So this will be something if you're comfortable with it, if you're in that subset of the population that wants it and welcomes it, you will be able to buy it. And if you're in the subset of the population that's a little concerned, maybe doesn't have a ton of confidence in it, you can not buy it. It's so I think the market will sort of decide. Now, I do think that what uh, NHTSA is trying to do with this pre-market approval is to address some of these concerns. I think what they're thinking, I don't know, but my guess is what they're thinking is that something at least that consumers could hang their hat on to say, well, I know that this vehicle I'm looking to buy has received NHTSA's, you know, s stamp of approval. I think the approach um, is f somewhat flawed. Um, and I think we need to have a long and hard conversation about whether this makes sense and if it does make sense, what it ought to look like. And it's probably not what NHTSA has suggested. But I do think there is probably some value in having a broader conversation about how do we tell you as, as a consumer that this particular vehicle you're looking at does check all the right boxes and this other one doesn't. Um, and whether that's NHTSA pre-approval or something else, I think it's at least a conversation worth having. Okay. 
Gary, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I want to get back to the, the point that, that was just made by the administrator about whether consumers want this technology. Having dealt with a lot of new technology over the years, and they never want the new technology as a fact. <laughs> two weeks ago, two studies came out that says consumers do not want driverless cars. We came out with a study a few weeks ago which actually pointed out if you ask a question a different way, if you ask about the benefits, do you want to make sure there's, you could deal with aggressive drivers or deal with inebriated drivers, the, questions are, the answers are overwhelming. Yeah, I'd love to have that. But go back in history before any of us were born. When the car was introduced, it was, you asked the, horse, the people at horses what they wanted in, in transportation, they said they wanted faster horses that eat less and poop less. <laughs> If you, if you go back to the, when the, the telephone was, was first, it was like considered a, who would want to use this device? Same thing with the computer, same thing with the Walkman, same thing with HDTV involved in the public policy debate in Congress. The big issue was, why would anyone want this? Why should we change our whole broadcasting system and require everyone to get new TVs and broadcast? Because no one's going to want it. And we heard that from a lot of people. No one will want it. And they were all wrong. And that's the history of technology. You know, Apple doesn't even do any consumer research. At most, they ask their employees to test their products, and they come up with something which delights us. And they've done it with three major new category introductions because they were willing to bet that consumers would want something else. Self-driving cars are the future. They are inevitable. And there will be all sorts of people who will say, this is not something I want. That's not something I'll ever want. And definitely already we're seeing in the research, to the extent that the people who do the research release the, the, the core results and the core questions, there is a demographic difference. Younger people want it. Older people don't. Mm -hmm. Unless they're really old, in which case they really want it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, and then there's other benefits. You ask people, do you want of course, this is an obvious one, but do you want your insurance premiums to go down? Of course they do, and will insurance premiums go down? I'd be shocked if they didn't, um, and, and they should go down. So there's a lot of benefits here, and in terms of the pre-approval process, I, I, I'll endorse what's just been said. I, I, I really think that you, you can't require every software upgrade. You can't require every model and, and, and spend several years, although there, there were some ambitious timelines put in the, in the document saying we'll approve everything or every exception within a, within a year, I think it was, um, and some quicker things, some turnarounds. But if you start having aftermarket equipment and things like that approved, and you follow the airline model, there was a hearing actually um, over a year ago by uh, one of the government oversight committees. And uh, Chairman Isa at the time raised the issue of, we don't want to follow the airline model. Because the problem of following the airline model is you will not have an aftermarket. You won't have the fleet transfer over. Basically, you'll be denying a whole generation of saved lives. The goal here is to get to those saved lives quicker, not later. And if you don't allow an aftermarket to develop, if you don't allow, if you require lengthy pre-approval process, you will delay this and you will cost human lives. And this is, I agree, this is the, great, the greatest public health opportunity the government may, may have our generation. And I think we should take advantage of it. So, Mark, when, when, you, when you first spoke, you mentioned that uh, the guidelines are voluntary. Presumably, moving forward, uh, NHTSA will attempt to undertake rulemaking, which is mandatory. Um, how should they go about doing that? How should they be able to maintain the flexibility necessary to give, to give folks the ability to develop the necessary technologies, but also clear enough so that, you know, folks can actually adhere to the standards? Yeah, so, I mean, I think one thing NHTSA has done uh, uh, prior to uh, the release of the Federal Automated Vehicles Policy uh, Guidance Document is that they, they uh, conducted a preliminary audit of Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards uh, that was released uh, earlier this year uh, looking for points of conflict with the existing standards um, and uh, new automated technology. Uh, I think an approach like that, a systematic approach, uh, and I think this is something uh, legislative and regulatory audits are something the state should be doing as well, um, and we already know there are some problems there. But uh, this is this is the, the right approach. Um, yes, there are going to be rulemakings. Um, NHTSA says in its, in its uh, uh, policy uh, that uh, Aspects of this will be mandated. I think that's to be expected. 
Um, but I think, uh, you know, as they raised in their current regulatory tools, uh, they also said they're going to uh, aggressively look at uh, uh, permitting more exemptions to uh, existing standards, which I think is important um, for the reasons that um, Adam and Gary laid out, um, that this is a moral issue. Uh, delay, if, if these vehicles are in fact safer uh, than manually driven vehicles, any delay or increase in cost uh, translates to additional highway deaths. So, um, you know, people are saying out there, and you have some self-styled safety advocates who have complained about uh, technology maybe not being perfect. Um, it'll never be perfect. Nothing's perfect. Um, there will always be road deaths. There's never, there's no such thing as th this vision zero is a is a is a complete myth. And I'm sorry to pick on some uh, of the of the regulators, but there will always be road deaths. There will always be deer running out of of the uh, adjacent forest and into a car. And you know we have over a million deer strikes uh, in the country a year. There will always be environmental hazards uh, and and strange things we can't predict that the technology won't be able to solve itself. So making the perfect the enemy of the good, I think, is a real problem. Um, and that's, I think, gets back to the precautionary principle um, approach that, uh, that Adam warned against. Um, but really, what we want to do is have a, have a consistent uh, pro-innovation uh, regulatory policy going forward. And I think, uh, despite what uh, NHTSA said about pre-market approval and some other aspects, uh, they clearly care very much about bringing this technology in market uh, rapidly. So I think there, there is a uh, sign of hope. Please. Yeah, I just, uh, Mark just said something I think is really important to sort of hammer home. Um, he talked about this audit that was done of existing motor vehicle safety standards to see which ones were in conflict. And I think it's important just as a, as a sort of a general statement for us to all appreciate and understand is so the way NHTSA is viewing this right now is if you have a car that looks like a car, like a, a car that the way you think a car with steering wheel, it's got brakes, it's got an accelerator pedal, um, and it's capable of being driven by a human driver, that's probably could be deployed in an automated fashion today without any new motor vehicle safety standards. The issue is if you have a car that doesn't look like a car, uh, doesn't have a steering wheel, it doesn't have pedals, um, and it's not capable of driv being driven by a human driver. That is where there is an existing gap right now in the existing motor vehicle safety code. And so I think it's not like there's an impediment to deploying the technology, there is an impediment to deploying the very highest levels of automation in a vehicle that does not have a conventional vehicle design. And I just think that's an important uh, distinction. David, you, you mentioned earlier on that uh, you think it's important for there to be a clear delineation between federal and state authorities. There is a model state policy within the guidance. Um, what is your perspective on the model state policy? Does it, does it strike the right balance and how can it be improved? It does strike the right balance in that talking about states should continue when the levels of authority in the business that they are currently in, in terms of dealing with the operation of the vehicle by a human being, licensure, and registration. If they do state safety inspections, clearly they stay in that business, but a lot of states are frankly getting out of that business. What they clearly should they do as soon as the operation turns over to the actual vehicle itself, which means turns back into federal authority, that that's where the federal authority should be, frankly, the uh, the leader and ultimately if there's ever a regulation it will be preemptive. I think there's a couple of points I think Mark and, and made, some, made a really good point is that if you are inviting the states after saying that well this the proper state role is this but then when you say but if you decide not to follow our suggestion <laughs> here is what you should do. I don't think that was a very wise idea. You were inviting your own challenge to a 116 page document that you feverishly wrote. That doesn't make very much sense to me. Second, you know, if you are going to buy into, you know, the interpretation that Mark talked about, which is in order to avoid having to go through the regulatory process to make this some type of a, a, a sticky safety mandate without it going through, you know, notice and comment and then OMB approval and everything else, you're going to actually have the state sort of, you know, uh, Trojan horse your own regulation. I don't think that's an appropriate way to achieve that goal either. By asking that question of the states that you should bake this into whatever, you know, approval process that you have, 
at the end of the day, if it's going to be a regulation, it should be a regulation. If it's going to be guidance, it should be guidance. And, and I think once you sort of kind of create this fish not foul situation in the state model policy, I think you're creating a number of unintended consequences. And 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 I and I hopefully that we'll have the opportunity to discuss this further with the agency as this process moves forward. Well, and we've already seen that a little bit in California's most recent draft regulations, where they are just in in their draft regs referencing these optional federal guidelines and making them. Mandatory. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to jump in here because I can't stress how bad this is in the sense. Um, so what what California is, is proposing, which is based on what NHTSA told them that they are perfectly okay with doing, is before we can test an automated system in the state of California, we would need to submit to the state of California the voluntary safety assessment that NHTSA asked us to, to submit to them. So if we don't do what's being asked of us voluntarily by NHTSA, we cannot test an automated system in the state of California. That is preposterous. And that means testing that's happening today could be halted, and it means testing that's about to be started could be delayed as we sit here and wait for NHTSA to figure out what exactly they want from us as far as these assessments go. It's a really troubling place that we found ourselves in. Yeah. So, so then, as we, as we wrap up and move toward audience questions, Adam, I wonder if we could start with you, a, a discreet recommendation for how NHTSA could change the guidance to improve it to, to speed deployment of the technology. Well, uh, I'd be happy to comment on that. I'd, I'd like to say first, we're here in Congress. I think Congress should have a role here. I think it, clearly a lot of these state problems we're having shouldn't fall entirely to NHTSA to handle themselves. Uh, uh, Congress should be making authority here with regards to what the preemption should look like, um, and it is absolutely needed. Um, there's no doubt about that. We could have a certain amount of de facto preemption, as NHTSA hits in the document, just based on the fact that most of the authority that for the states to regulate in this area revolve around the hook of the actual human driver. And once the human driver is no longer there, then obviously a lot of that authority will shift to NHTSA if it's the one regulating the software for better or for worse. Um, but then again, the California situation shows what will happen when some states continue to want to meddle on that side even after the human driver has exited the picture. Um, so that's, that's a real problem. But Congress, I think, needs to address this at a minimum. Congress needs to absolutely be aware of the fact it's going to have to exercise ongoing authority and oversight um, because I think we're firmly in the realm of soft law now. And the guidance, you know, this is, there's this question, is this voluntary? Is this guidance? What is this document? And I wrote a whole lengthy piece about this because I'm an old stickler for political science and good governance and said, you know, what, what is this thing? Um, is this mandatory or not? What, what are we talking about? And yet in every field of emerging technology policy I cover, the whole name of the game today is soft law, multi-stakeholderism, and agency threats. There's no more law being passed at all. There's no more firm regulation. And this is because of what my friend Larry Downs likes to call in his book, The Laws of Disruption. The fundamental law of, this, uh, of disruption of the information age is that technology grows exponentially, policy grows incrementally, and the gap between the two grows every single year. As the pace of change moves at the pace of Moore's law, as it now is doing on our vehicles, it means policy is going to break down. And everything is going to be in the realm of soft law and agency threats. Congress has to exercise some authority over NHTSA and say, like, here's what we're going to do to make sure this stays on track. Um, but for better or for worse, this is the world we now live in. And guidance documents like this are going to become a regular thing. Gary. Great points, Adam. Um, truly, it's called voluntary. But in our age of litigation, if a uh, manufacturer doesn't follow them, they're, they're undertaking a risk. I'm not saying the, the, the litigators, the lawyers who sue on the basis of not complying will be a win, but they will likely be in court. So there's no such thing as voluntary anymore. And, and, and it, it's a huge problem, not only in this, but other things that NHTSA is trying to do, is that they're creating, um, they're trying to create liability for companies without any real authority, without any real process, without notice and comment rulemaking just by calling it voluntary guidance. And I think that's unhealthy. And that's something that the tech industry struggles with mightily. The um, second part of it is, and Hillary referred to this, is that we're dealing with a statutory regime which did not anticipate cars without drivers. And because of that, throughout the statutes, it just, that's what it's all based on. And that's what it's referred to. Yet, we have Ford that's already announced that in five years they will be mass producing cars without steering columns or all the cost that goes into supporting that driver. And they'll have a safer car, 
without a lot of without all that additional cost and without the ability for a driver to take over. Now, um, I believe it's Mercedes has announced a different route. They said they will never introduce a car where a driver cannot take over, and that's that's the free market. Let competition rule there. But we need to make sure that our statutory regime allows Ford to go forward with the mass production they want to have in Michigan. I think that's important for our country, and it's important for the, for our safety. So there is a role of Congress in terms of when and how Congress operates. I think we got to look at the old laws and see how they should be updated. But although I am interested in rushing towards a self-driving car, I'm not interested in rushing Congress. I think it has to be deliberative, and there has to be hearings, and there has to be a lot of input and figure out how we change with that big goal in mind of saving lives. Mark, please. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the I think the role of Congress here is important, and like uh, what Gary just said. Um, uh, I think oversight, oversight, oversight. Um, I'd also look uh, more into uh, preemption, as Adam said. But in terms of what NHTSA itself can do, I'd like it to rescind its its statement uh, in the uh, in Section Two in the model state policy, telling states to mandate the uh, the uh, uh, performance assessment uh, in in their uh, in their uh, permitting processes. Uh, and I'd really like to see them de-emphasize to the states. Uh, setting up these new regulatory regimes and instead emphasize going back and auditing your motor vehicle codes in your states. Um, one problem that's been identified um, and I've done some work on is that um, most states prohibit uh, what's known as automated vehicle platooning, the, the idea that you could, you could have these uh, cars packed very tightly together, computer controlled, um, moving very quickly down a highway, and that uh, can result in a lot of congestion benefits uh, and things like that. The trucking industry is very interested in that. But we have laws on the books following too closely statutes, um, anti-tailgating rules uh, that essentially prohibit that function. So I think uh, you know it's not just the 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 sort of the way that we interact with drivers, uh, or the, the way policy interacts with drivers, or the way it, it interacts through the traditional motor vehicle safety standards. There's also things on the books, operations rules uh, in the states that need to be addressed. So um, yeah, just to repeat, um, de-emphasize uh, you know the creation of these new uh, of these new agency processes in the states, and instead, NHTSA should be telling the states uh, to look uh, look in the mirror and see what existing uh, problems may exist in your motor vehicle codes. Hillary, your thoughts? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything. One thing, though, I was just thinking about that I wanted, uh, uh, one of the areas that I, I see as um, uh, tr problematic uh, is, uh, I mentioned this 15-point safety assessment. What we are finding as we're going through this document is that there is a lot of ambiguity and vagueness about what exactly is being requested of us in order to comply with these different areas. I get it. The point of it, I think NITS is purposely trying to be flexible in its approach, which is something that we've urged them to do. But the problem is if there is going to be accountability and there is going to be enforcement, which NITSA has implied that there will be, meaning if something goes wrong and we've certified that we had met a certain area that we could be held accountable for failing, you know, to do something right. Um, if there's going to be accountability and enforcement, we're probably going to need a little teeny bit more meat on the bones on some of these areas. Not all of them. Some of them, I think, give us the direction that we need. Other areas, like the cybersecurity section, um, there's a few of the data section, which we haven't talked about yeah. the data section yet. I've read them multiple times. I still can't tell you exactly what NITS is asking us to do. Um, and that's problematic. Uh, and so I think that's an area that con Congress could probably exercise some oversight on and making sure that there's enough direction for industry as we go forward. Uh, to uh, pick up where Hillary just left off, I think the data question is a huge one because there's a number of ambiguities as to what the agency is looking for, what it wants. As I said in my opening remarks, the agency is looking to learn. And it's also looking to be able to build its ability for analytics. My issue as sort of obviously transition question is this, ultimately it's going to be my hope for better agency capability. Mm -hmm. NHTSA is a staff, has a staff of 600 people. Half of them work in either supporting the agency or dealing with the behavioral programs. The actual vehicle safety arm is around 300 or so employees. And then on top of that, the number of engineers is actually a lower number than that. For us talking about the ability to deal with all they're asking for in terms of data, being able to analyze, be able to think it through, and frankly support the process of how whatever is going to be in terms of being able to jump through the hoops to deploy 
you know, I think the Congress, the one thing I would ask is to actually better resource the agency to deal with this new mission, because frankly, if we think of NHTSA just basically, you know, shoehorning an office of five or six more people to deal with all this, I don't think we're serving the general public or frankly the regulated entity well in sort of dealing with these issues. Well, great. So that means we've got about 10 minutes for questions. We don't have a microphone, but if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand. And yes, ma'am, please. Uh, 